it's the worst moment in your life and you are reliant on a total stranger and a system that no one understands. Our entire emergency communication infrastructure runs basically on the public switch telephone network. You can think of it almost conceptually as a, as a copper phone line system, an infrastructure that dates back to the middle of the 20th century. And so the result is in the middle of an emergency, you need to verbally articulate your name, location, and what is occurring. The FCC estimates that there's over 10,000 lives that could be saved annually if we could just more accurately and more quickly locate people when they call 911. Welcome to Crazy Good Turns. I'm your host, Frank Blake. And what we do on this show is we celebrate people who do amazingly great things for others. And today we have a great show for you. We're going to be talking about a group that helps out the over 10,000 people a year who could be saved by having a better 911 experience. So we're going to be talking about that with the founder of Rapid SOS and also a key member of his team. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Michael, where I'd like to start, maybe even before getting into the details of what Rapid SOS is, I'm always interested hearing about founding stories, how somebody like yourself decides to step out and co-found a business like this. What's the founding story? As you mentioned, we were founded actually almost nearly six years ago now. Uh, and I grew up in very rural Indiana and actually came to New York City after um, after college for my first big uh, job in finance. Was living in Spanish Harlem at the time and was walking home very late one night from work about 2 a.m. And just happened to be uh, to be followed and, and basically had my uh, welcome to New York mugging experience, which I think uh, perhaps sometimes is a rite of passage way out here. <laughs> So it was the first time that I ever had an experience needing to call 911, and it was the first time realizing that it doesn't matter what your emergency is, it is difficult in the middle of an assault, a kidnapping, a heart attack, whatever that emergency is, to get out your cell phone, dial a number, and have a coherent conversation. And then subsequently, um, my, my father had an incident. As I mentioned, I grew up in rural Indiana. We had a particularly heavy snowstorm where he had climbed on the roof of our home. And unfortunately, no one was at home, and he slipped and fell um, as he was trying to clear the snow. So he shatters his hip, and he broke his wrist. And I, live in a very, I grew up in a very rural part of the United States where there's poor cell reception. So again, it was a circumstance where very difficult to reach 911 from a cell phone despite the fact that we had Wi-Fi at our home at the time. So if you know if you could reach first responders via Skype or WhatsApp or, or any of the kind of modern voice or cloud communication tools, it would have worked. These two events focused in, I think, on the challenge and obviously was, was just blown away the more we spent time with just the heroes that work in public safety every day in the United States and the challenges that they were facing from the same legacy system. So was this, Michael, was this in the back of your head as you went on after school to do other things and then it pops out at some future years later or did you start working on it uh, right after those events? I came to New York to work in venture capital and was working on building businesses around clean sustainable energy primarily and then just had this experience in December 2012 uh, late one night and that's really what drove, you know, looking at this challenge. I had recently gotten my first smartphone and so starting to use Uber and it was like, you know, I can press a button and get a, essentially a taxi cab anywhere I need in New York City at the time. Why is it that I can't just simply press a button and get a police fire or an ambulance when I need it? And so that started this exploration into this challenge. Ultimately, I went away to graduate school to work on it, where I met my co-founder, Nick Horlick, uh, who was doing his PhD at MIT at the time, and he'd had some similar experiences. We ultimately um, would go out during grad school, and we, we drove, and uh, my dad let me borrow his Prius. We would drive over 1,500 miles and meet with several hundred agencies, just learning about how 911 operates across the United States. And I'm obviously fortunate to have Jeff on the phone with us here as well, and, and, and Jeff has built a 20-plus year career in this industry. So he's, you know, he's, he's definitely uh, seen firsthand on the other side of the challenges of just basically managing 250 million emergencies a year with little more than a voice connection. 
it is remarkable how well 911 works in light of that. It's truly a testament of the people who work in this industry. But in 2018, there's just such a need and opportunity to do more of technology here. That is so well said. I spent, I, I'm a chair of, on the board of a hospital here in Atlanta. And I spent a day last month actually following our ambulance as it went around to different points around the city. And just exactly what you said, I mean, heroes working in the field every day, but the technology, so much of an opportunity there. So maybe you want to describe what your thought process is and what's your product or products from Rapid SOS. As we got deeper into understanding the industry and, and, and visiting with hundreds of 911 centers across the United States, what became apparent is that our entire emergency communication infrastructure runs basically on the public switch telephone network. So you can think of it almost conceptually as a, as a copper phone line system, uh, an infrastructure that dates back to the middle of the 20th century. And so the result is in the middle of an emergency, you need to verbally articulate your name, location, and what is occurring. And obviously, it, it can be very difficult to do that in the middle of an emergency. And oftentimes, we may not know our address, for example. So Today, you're still in an environment where we don't immediately locate most wireless 911 calls, for example, so you still need to often verbally provide that address. The FCC estimates that there's over 10,000 lives that could be saved annually if we could just more accurately and more quickly locate people when they call 911, let alone transfer any other information. So as we studied this challenge more and more, we realized we increasingly live in this connected world where there's more and more data than ever that is capable of providing detailed information around an emergency. We really felt like there's an opportunity to connect all the data that is around us in our homes, in our vehicles, in, in, in digital health devices, industrial sensors, et cetera, and make that data useful for first responders. As a result, we can actually accelerate emergency response times and provide a more effective response. Brilliant idea bring emergency response into the 21st century, but sometimes people you know, don't want to get into the new century as fast as they should. So what's been the receptivity and your rollout? We were fortunate early on to have thousands of folks in the public safety community. We had over 4,000 beta testers of our technology early on, uh, first responders, that really looked at partnering with us. I mean, we were admittedly a group of computer nerds uh, out of Harvard and MIT and had, you know, we didn't have deep experience in public safety. We, now we've been fortunate to have people like Jeff join us in this and, and bring that expertise to the table. But in the early days, it was really working hand in hand with these 911 centers across the United States to, the, to develop the technology. Not surprisingly, if you are a 911 telecommunicator and you are managing, you know, statistically, we're, we're, we're talking about 650,000 emergencies a day in the United States, 500,000 approximately from cell phones. If you can't even accurately locate those callers, you can imagine just how challenging those circumstances are. For example, I'll, I'll never forget, Frank, my very first 911 call that I had the opportunity to listen in on. It was, I was in rural Massachusetts, and it was a mother who called after her son had committed suicide. She called, and she was just hysterical. Her son was, had hung himself in the closet, and, and I lasted 15 seconds on that, that call, Frank, and then I actually took off my headset and I had to walk outside. And now that 911 telecommunicator stayed on the phone for the next 15 minutes to figure out the address of the emergency and stayed on the phone with the woman until the ambulance arrived. And then she would do that for the rest of her 12-hour shift that day. It, it's hard to really describe until you've been at these centers just the intensity of the experience, the dedication of the people. That is really where this partnership emerged to drive this technology out to every center in the United States, and there's over 6,000 of them, was... The people that are on the front lines of this every single day really rallied behind this concept that we can do more with more information and more data, and we can make this whole system more efficient. So, Jeff, maybe maybe you want to comment on, just from your perspective as someone with a lot of experience and background in managing emergencies and public safety, how did you hear about this idea? What were your reactions? What from your perspective, are the key problems that it solves? Well, Frank, I mean, uh, I first, uh, I've been in, as Michael mentioned, public safety for 20 years and, and retired from the sheriff's office. I've uh, been on 
many, you know, thousands and thousands of 911 calls in my my career. But I think um, when wireless phones first came out, sort of gives away my age, there was a time where we used to tell people to pull over near a payphone, hang up, and then dial 911 back so we could get the address of the payphone because we could not locate those wireless devices. And unfortunately, there's been some technological advances, but not many. So uh, I was uh, lucky enough to be running uh, one of the largest um, software companies that provides software to 911 centers, but I've been very frustrated with how fast the pace of change was in public safety. Uh, and I saw Michael uh, and heard about uh, his mission, and I thought, well, look at this young whippersnapper. That's really good. <laughs> and then I uh, maybe discounted his, and maybe just because I've been tainted, I've been in the industry too long. But he really started to make progress, and his passion came through, and he started to make uh, real inroads with the public safety community. Once location could be determined from the handset, and he says, uh, we had a chance to meet when I was in New York City, he articulated his vision and his passion. I was like, I'm in. I can't tell you how frustrating it is for a 911 telecommunicator or dispatcher to be on the phone and spend the first average of about anywhere from 45 seconds to a minute and a half just trying to get the location. People, when they're panicked in an emergency, have a really tough time articulating where they are, even if they're sitting at home. I mean, I can't tell you how many people couldn't remember their home address, and this could be the worst time of their life. People ask me if I go to a dinner party with my wife and say, what do you do? And I say, well, we're trying to improve uh, you know, the location accuracy when people dial 911. And most people at the party, if they're not my law enforcement buddies, uh, will say, you mean they can't? There's this big disconnect where the public thinks, hey, it's like Uber, 911, or they see CSI or something and think, oh, they can pinpoint me immediately. And that's not necessarily the case. The radius they get is many times where we'll just get the um, cell tower location, which could be a mile, mile and a half away from where you actually are. And sometimes it pinpoints better, but uh, it's still a pretty big radius. I've been on, again, hundreds of calls at the sheriff's office. We have both rural and uh, uh, urban environment in a sheriff's office. And we'd be in a, a rural environment. Someone goes off the a county road and literally the dispatcher would go on the radio and tell us to turn our sirens on and then ask the caller, can you hear the sirens? And that's how we would locate somebody who went off the road. So it, you can see how important this location. And with Rapid SOS, I mean, we can now pinpoint that device and get there much faster. And those responses, it could be as delayed as much as a half hour in that case I just gave you. So so I'm all in, and, and as you can probably tell from Michael's passion, it's infectious. So that's uh, the reason I joined. Michael, switching gears slightly, you've been around startups since you got out of school. And in fact, I looked at your background, you did some interesting entrepreneurial activity even when you were in high school. Were there any things that were more difficult than you anticipated, and how did you handle them? Certainly, there's plenty of challenges along the way. I, I think it is, compared to some of the other uh, entrepreneurial endeavors that I've been a part of, w what's a little bit different about this one is the balance is so overwhelmingly skewed for me towards the positives of this journey. One, because I care greatly about this particular topic. Two, because of the nature of the people involved, meaning that I've just been overwhelmed by the response of the public safety and first responder community in wanting to work with us and collaborate with us. I mean, I think in many ways it just highlighted just the severity of the challenge and the need here. Um, and so having that opportunity to, to work very closely with those folks has, has been really powerful uh, for us. And then finally, I think is, you know, we, we do think of it as a, as a very large global challenge that we think we're on the cusp of, of, of solving and of you know, have, have great success in the United States for solving. Now, I think, you know, the challenges here, I mean, this is the, the public safety industry, as, as Jeff mentioned, is highly fragmented. So we have approximately 6,000 different 911 centers in the United States. Those 911 centers are running close to 25,000 different software systems. So we really had to figure out how do we plug data and, and, and you know, work to shift actually a paradigm from a voice-based system to a data-driven approach in a very mission-critical life-and-death industry. And I think that compared to some of the other startups that I'd worked on, you know, it took some time to appreciate how to do that well in this industry. Certainly in the early days, we asked a lot of stupid questions <laughs> and <laughs> made, you know, uh, made a number of, of mistakes in our early um, technological approaches 
that, again, if we didn't have this set of 4,000 first responders that were beta testing the technology, probably would never have made it. But because we got so much engagement and feedback early on, I think it's the reason that this idea and vision became possible. And so that just makes it much more satisfying, I think, and, and much more exciting for me personally. And was there anyone's advice that you particularly relied on going through this, particularly in the early days? And if so, what was the advice? I started this, you know, I would say as a, <laughs> I, I, to use Jeff's terminology, as a naive whippersnapper, <laughs> uh, you know, who had um, no public safety um, experience. I'd only had kind of uh, tech development experience and, uh, and Nick, my co-founder, similarly. So there was endless amounts of device along the way here in all aspects of building this. And I do think we are fortunate really on, on, on two main fronts. One was just the, and I think you're seeing this consistent theme, but to have this industry that had seen limited change, particularly from a technical standpoint over the last 50 years, just come forward and really embrace this challenge. So we had the leadership or former leadership of all the major public safety associations that worked with us as we iterated on the on the ideas. As I mentioned, we had a, a very large group of first responders and uh, public safety telecommunicators that worked with us as well on that. So that was kind of on the core technology and, and product that we were building. We also were fortunate to be doing it in grad school, and so there was tremendous assistance from Harvard University and MIT as we were building this. There was approximately around $500,000 of grant funding that was provided by those universities and and a a few other groups to support the endeavor when we were quite small. We had an early team of grad students that were willing to work for free on this, uh, which obviously was critical to its early inception. And then today, having a team of 50 people that care deeply about this, uh, about this topic. I mean, people like Jeff that ran some of the largest public safety companies previously and, and left all of that to go try to build something new here. And, you know, that takes a tremendous courage to go leave something that's really established and to try to build something new. And again, we, we've seen that with from, from just brilliant engineers to all the public safety folks that helped along the way to the investors and advisors that we have. The last thing I'll mention, I, I could probably talk <laughs> the whole podcast on this, Frank. It was There was so many people that helped build it, but I mean... We also very quickly were fortunate to work with people that had intersected this challenge from a technology and telecom standpoint. So three former FCC chairmen um, became very involved and and, uh, people that the former C-suite leadership of some very large tech and telecom companies. How do you get them involved? Do you just send them a, here's an email, here's my idea, what do you think? Or networking or sitting outside their office, how do you get them involved? You know, I think the more I dug in, particularly after my my, um, summer in grad school when I I visited uh, several hundred 911 centers, I think the magnitude of the challenge began to sink in to sink in for me. And I realized that this was going to take a much broader influence of expertise or, or network of expertise and community to build this. So I began in earnest and, and actually in the early days, um, myself and my co-founder had a rule that we would talk to at least 10 different 911 centers per week, each of us. We wanted to talk to at least 10 different 911 centers per week. So 20 in total between the two of us. Just to build up the base knowledge. Yeah, and to really understand what the challenges were and and also hopefully to meet people that would be willing to work with us and mentor us along the way. As I mentioned, that's how you turn from two grad students into this community of 4,000 first responders that really believed in this idea. And then as we started to learn more there, I also realized, like, we're going to need to talk to people like Dave Nagel, who ran R&D for Apple, was CTO of AT&T, was CEO of Palm Pilot, and and really understood the challenge from a telecom and tech standpoint. So we would, you know, identify who these individuals were, and we'd scramble our guest email addresses and just (laughs) send them out. And um, it, it was just, again and again, Frank, it was amazing how people stepped up to help and support this idea and, and really just donated time, insight, and advice to be a part of this. Wow. One of the interesting things about what you and Jeff and team are doing is you're helping hundreds and thousands, millions of people, but they don't know it. 
right? If, if I'm using a 911 service, I have no idea whether I'm connected as a user to Rapid SOS or not. How do you get the feedback for you and your team on the positive momentum? And are there customer stories that you hear, share with your team? Where does the positive drive come from? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Jeff can comment on this as well, because obviously his team uh, is out every day working with 911 centers across the United States. It is, I think for us, just such a source of, of positive energy to have this network of people that help build it and are now seeing the data flow through. So we've obviously been working on this challenge for close to six years now. There was a lot of infrastructure build that had to occur behind the scenes here, Frank. So the result is, you know, for three or four years here, we were working on it and we were iterating with public safety officials, but there was, at the end of the day, no content, right? We were just building infrastructure. But today, as, as we talked about through our, our work with Apple, Google, Uber, Microsoft, and others, we're now actually flowing life-saving data from hundreds of millions of devices and for, as I mentioned, the majority of, of emergencies across the United States. And we are now starting to see the impact of that work. So we've had a number of agencies reach out and just give us stories and anecdotes of that. Even on early iterations of our technology, we had a hiker, for example, that was lost in the mountains in North Carolina who happened to have a early iteration of our technology. And it was in a inclement weather, and he, he was lost and ended up using the service to reach the local 911 center and was located immediately and saved within half an hour. In the same sort of weather event, there was two other hikers that were also lost in the mountains and unfortunately didn't have access to the technology, and it would ultimately take an over 100-person manhunt and two thermal imaging helicopters in a, uh, in a multi-day search to locate them and ultimately save their lives. What a powerful example. Wow. So I think we've started to see these antidotes come through. But I, I, Jeff, I don't know if there's anything um, you wanted to add as well um, from your side. Sure. Well, I think, Frank, you mentioned two things. One, that the public doesn't necessarily know. And that's actually probably a good thing. There have been attempts in the past where you have to have an app or you have to do download something or do something unique. The one thing the public knows in a panic is they dial 911. And I think uh, Michael saw that in, and Nick, the co our co-founder, early on and had it embedded in the workflow when you dial 911. So there's nothing the public has to do. It might not be great for branding, but it's very important in an emergency that uh, something else doesn't, an app doesn't have to be added or anything like that. It's embedded in these devices they use to call. So I think that's the first part. And uh, the second part, like Michael said, is... Uh, the powerful stories pretty much sell themselves and, and, and promote our what we're doing to public safety. Another example we had in uh, so the southeastern United States is elderly gentleman had a, a cardiac emergency, sort of fainted, had really trouble breathing, but was able to dial 911. And uh, he was in a, a grocery store, and the dispatcher was, "Hey, sir, where are you?" And he, you know, he's in a panic, and you know, you know help, please get here quickly. And he articulated he was at, uh, uh, you know. Uh, at a grocery like Fresh Market. He says, oh, I'm Fresh Market. I'm here. Please help. Hurry, hurry, hurry. The dispatcher on the screen could see our Rapid SOS location, and it was at a different grocery store uh, about a mile and a half away. And she kept saying, sir, I'm, my screen's showing, hey, you're at a you know, you're at a Whole Foods. No. And he was getting a little angry, <laughs> like most do, and they're panicked. And uh, eventually, this, this uh, telecommunicator dispatcher had two EMS units respond to both places, and he was still arguing that he was at Fresh Market when they walked into Whole Foods. So it's just an example of when you're in that panic, it's the last thing you, is you're where you are and everything, and, and you're not necessarily thinking straight. So uh, those stories like that, and there's, there's, uh, we're getting hundreds of others as we deploy all over the country. The big point to, you made early on is people don't necessarily need to know what's wrapped us. They, they dial 911. It's the same way they've been doing it for 50 years, and uh, it needs to be that way to be successful. That's That's terrific. A couple of wrap-up questions. First, Michael, how's your dad? Is he okay? Yeah, he was. Uh, <laughs> he had a uh, strong recovery, and he's he's uh, completely fine uh, today. It, uh, <laughs> did 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 take uh, some surgery, but uh, he's he's totally fine today, and feel very uh, very fortunate for that. And this is a much more general question. As someone you've spent a lot of time in the tech world already in your young career and are on to something really fascinating with Rapid SOS, do you look out and say, 
wow, there are just so many other things to do of connecting newer technologies to help people in unusual ways, or do you just feel incredibly fortunate to have happened on this one great instance? I think that, that we're in a time where there is a profound ability of technology to impact major global challenges, if done correctly. And, and I am a firm believer in the potential to solve big global challenges that way. Having spent the last uh, five and a half years now in this industry, like this is my passion and focus is, is solving this challenge. It's just been motivated by, it, it's like one of these industries that like you never think about, right? And then it's the worst moment in your life. And you are reliant on a total stranger and a system that no one understands behind the scenes, right? And now, having spent the last five and a half years meeting the end of the people that dedicate their lives to those moments, the people that, you know, for example, after uh, Hurricane Irma uh, struck South Florida last year, we had a chance to uh, uh, spend some time with the Collier County 911 Center. And so as everyone else was evacuating, you know, from this massive hurricane, it's those individuals that are, their families are leaving and they are staying there in the heart of the storm, managing the crisis. And that occurs all over the United States, as I, I think about as, as Hurricane Michael today is impacting Florida. And, and it's just an extraordinary thing. And I, I hope that Jeff and I and our team can do everything we can to help the people that really, I think, are on the front lines of saving lives every day in the United States and globally. This is my mission and purpose at this point in my life, and it's just a privilege to, to do it with so many great people. That is fantastic. And Jeff, any, any other comments you want to make in closing? No, I don't. Uh, I just think uh, we're looking forward to, to bringing this to every now and one center in the nation. And my mission is, uh, is to get this globally covered, get the Michael's passion to every first responder on the planet. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you like what you've heard, please leave us a review on iTunes. These are hugely important to us, and so I hope you'll do that. And share your stories with us at hello at crazy good turns, or share them directly with me at frank at crazy good turns. We love to get these stories, and they serve as the source of future episodes. So thank you again for listening, and I hope you'll send in your thoughts and comments.